Good morning and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. This morning, we're going to continue our walkthrough of H687 with our Legislative Council, Ellen Tchaikovsky. Good morning, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. Um, so yesterday we left off on page 48 of draft 4.1, which is dated February 20th. Um, so the there's a new section on page 48 uh, that's proposed by the planners. Um, and it's highlighted in yellow. I have, I, and it doesn't have a section number because I was trying to figure out if this was the place in the bill it should go or if the bill needs to be rearranged slightly, but so sorry, but um, so on page 48, this is adding some additional language regarding the designation process for uh, tiers 1B and tier th and 3. So on, so separating those out from the other, separating 1B out from 1A. So on page 48, uh, regional plan, future land use map review, designation of tier 1B and 3, the board shall review requests from regional planning commissions to approve approve with conditions or disprove portions of future land use maps for the purposes of changing jurisdictional thresholds under this chapter and to approve designations pursuant to 24 VSA chapter 139. And chapter 139 is the section at the end of this bill on the new designations. The board may produce guidelines for regional planning commissions to seek to obtain these designations. If requested by the regional planning commission, the board shall complete the re this review concurrently with regional plan approval. Um, so I do just want to flag for discussion. Um, they proposed adding this the phrase approved with conditions versus approve versus disapprove. So I think you'll just want to check that how, how you want the, the approval process to play out. Because I think in the prior version, what you had is that if there was an issue with the regional plan that they then had 18 months to fix it and then come back to the board for approval. Um, and so this would be approved with conditions. Um, so I think you have some options here on if you, you know, enforcement on regional plans doesn't really exist right now. And so how you want that to play out if there's an issue with a regional plan, what you want the board's options to be in regards to that. Uh, Representative Pat, I, I, I think I understand the, the arguments on this, but 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 if it's if, if it's approved with conditions, there would need to be a process for checking that the conditions were being met, and that doesn't that doesn't exist now. So there is, so well, so it doesn't exist now. No, but you could. What you could do is make. I think. You have a, a check-in cycle, or there's uh, a four a four-year check-in with re with them needing to recertify their plan every eight years. So I think that's the only mechanism right now. But then, yeah, it is a little bit vague on how you want the ERB to sort of be like monitoring and enforcing. Representative Bonger. So the way that we have. I think first intention that without this language, what could happen is either the region, either the board will approve it, or the board would send it back saying, "Do you're lacking in A, B, and C? Get that ready and bring it back to us." There's no, you say up to eight, it's up to eighteen months to do that, but they also could do it in thirty days, right? They, um, so. Having this thing with conditions complicate and adds this new wrinkle of having to then make sure there was follow through, and I'm just wondering whether it's really necessary, or whether whether we whether that process of just sending it back saying you're almost there, just do this, and we'll be bring it back to us. I don't know. 
What's the difference between that and conditions? I mean, it's approved. First one's approved. It's approved. It's approved with these. Yeah, as long as you do this. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. It's an, well, it's an interesting, I think, I don't think it's a huge difference, but it's an interesting thing because it's not like you're issuing a permit, you're just approving what the regional plan has already done. So adding conditions to that, it's just, I hadn't thought about it that way. Does either of the planners in the room want to add to that? Uh, yeah, Chris Guy from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, I think this was based on a conversation we had with um, Charlie Baker. Um, the downtown board right now has received some process where it can <laughs> approve with conditionally remove the designation. You know, there's, and I think that was the intent of mirroring that um, process in this language. And I don't think it quite adds the amount of detail that the downtown board has in their like, conditional approval process. <clears throat> the intent was to, you know, Sometimes you're very close. You just need to do a few more things and why hold it up? Um, and our board right now, if they're unhappy, they can just pull the designation and say, we are not happy with you and you have not met our conditions. And so maybe looking at that language may be a, a help. I think, can you for the record, so I'm Kennedy, I'm with Mama Spetney Regional Planning Commission and I'm sitting in for Charlie today and he apologizes, he has another meeting. Uh, I think I agree with Representative Bongard. It, it probably is cleaner is to have review and then through the review have conditions to have it approved. Otherwise, I think you're going to have to set up criteria for what can. So where does it become approved with conditions needs to be disapproved? And I think that margin gets murky. So I think the cleaner you can make it, the better would be my my suggestion. And not sure I'm disagreeing with Charlie on this or whether, but I think it would just make it clean. And that's what we do with town plans. We do not do conditional improvements hmm. to town plans. Yeah. So if we want to be consistent in this process, because hmm. we have a checklist when we do it, well, I'm going to use a town plan. And then in the checklist, we'll say you need to work on X, Y, and Z yeah. for approval. Let's try Representative Sevilla. Madam Chair, we're in plan growth area designation. Yep. Page 48. Yep. Yep. So I have a question proceeding yeah. page 48. Uh, around the critical resource area definition. Okay. Uh, and I spent some time here late last night trying to figure out um, if these are already mapped. This is not my world. Um, are all of those items that are in the critical resource area definition um, items that we already map? Critical corridors are mapped. Um, wetlands are mapped. Slopes um, to a certain degree are mapped, but we've taken some testimony that they need more detail. Um, and shallow to bedrock Westfield map slopes greater than 20% and shallow to soils shallow to bedrock. So we can find out where they got their data, but yes, it's somewhere. It's in the soils, perhaps. Yeah. Um, prime ag soils taking testimony that's available, but um, can be variable It's in its efficacy, is how I would characterize it. Um, and connecting habitat. And, I, and actually, I, um, I have a larger proposal related to tier three that I can bring up now, um, which is that um, there has been a lot of controversy around the tier three idea. And, um, but, but actually, not when, when you separate tier three from a jurisdictional trigger, you, um, the controversy tends to kind of move away and the ecologists come to something not too far from this. We've gotten some written testimony and, and verbal testimony about what a critical resource might be from Center for Eco Studies, from Eric Sorensen. From... So I've been thinking a lot about it and I've been thinking about um, some of the town testimony we took and how towns are implementing not just our Act 171 of a number of years ago around forest blocks and habitat connectors, but additionally, 
again, I dug deep into what Westfield, not deep, but I've dug into and want to dig deeper into what Westfield brought us. And they have essentially done this um, and used it in the process. So what I would like us to consider is using tier three to inform the future land use mapping process and help our towns do better mapping in that planning process and um, potentially then ask agency of natural resources to come back to us with what is a tier three resource and how would it best be integrated into act 250 either through a jurisdictional trigger or through permitting or some other way of protecting any critical resource that um, should be a jurisdictional trigger so subset of the so so uh <clears throat> that sounds like a great idea on the face of it um uh did you mention if connecting habitat was um something that was already mapped so connecting habitat is as we've heard is is a to, in my mind a subset of a larger piece of vermont conservation design and we would need to put a clear definition on what we mean by that if we are to head down this path um, and or could be part of what it brings back to us but um, so it's already mapped but at different levels of again uh, I would say different levels of um, detail so um, thank you madam chair that's really helpful I'm trying to make sure that I can help my uh, constituents understand what we're contemplating and how to direct them to look at maps that might exist <clears throat> and just kind of understand the greater ecology here. Another flag that I'd like to plant on this paragraph uh, in the definition of critical resource area, I'm aware that there's a river corridor and wetlands bill that is moving. And so I am uh, interested in our discussion about how those, uh, that bill, and this bill, which will cross in the night, um, you know, just how we will kind of rectify um, those potential issues. So just planting that flag. Yeah, so I've been thinking about that too, and um, how river corridors actually already are included in Act 250 review. And so I would imagine that having this, the permit process will be kind of integrated into refining that Act 250 review in the way that wetlands permitting also refines the review of wetlands. So, and I'm not saying we're not doing, we need to do it, we need to follow that ball through the process of the ships passing in the night. But I think, um, I see that it's kind of already happening. We just have to make sure that it lines up the way we want it to. When we get that bill, and then I expect the Senate will do the same, and then we'll have to work it out. Representative Stevens. I may just need more coffee, but your proposal for how to look at tier three, how does that differ from what is currently proposed? Um, well, currently in here, it, tier three would be an automatic Act 250 jurisdiction. So separating the ecological and the planning part of that from the jurisdictional part of that until we get more clarity around it. And it's going to, I will say, I would also like to talk about tier two when we get to there and how it relates. And then um, other thoughts on tier one timing and what's in there. So I think in, in terms of tiers, if I might just summarize, like, so in this bill, we have a tier one A that is defined um, as our legislative council has reminded us based on the 10 criteria of Act 250 um, in a in a previous conversation around uh, enhanced designation that would have included a uh, sort of local exemption from Act 250, but it would demonstrate that the town was committed to those criteria in that on their own in, in implementing that. Um, and then the, the tier the tier three was intended to be those resources of of statewide significance that the state should be responsible for making sure are protected throughout any land use review, things that um, that matter to all of us. And I guess my mind's been moving towards water being the unifying feature of that, but um, you know, we've, we've taken some testimony that there's this need for some more conversations there. Um, but 
And in the meantime, the regional planning commissions have come in and said, well, we were happy to help map critical resources, tell us what they are. And I think ecologically, we might know what they are, um, but politically, we need to have that conversation still. So I would like, uh, in order to support our towns in doing great planning, part of that is getting them access to the existing data for mapping all of the resources in their town. So including ecological resources. So we help them with mapping their parcels and their roads and their everything else, and just ramping up how we can support them in mapping the features of the landscape that are important, but letting them plan for how they are gonna integrate them into their local planning process. Can I ask a follow-up? Yes. So if tier three, were to be sort of a, you know, not have a jurisdictional trigger for now until we have, you know, that the process and the mapping and the conversation. Um, what does that mean for those? Would, would that mean that the current process in terms of Act 250 would remain for, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out, so if someone wanted to build something, um, in a potential tier or in a, in a non-tier one and a non-tier two area. Does that mean it would just continue with the current I-250 process? I'm trying to figure we out. We would have two tiers functionally and creating the forest block and habitat connector criteria if they were under Act 250 jurisdiction would, you know, include that review. It, so presumably that's a way of getting to ecological function. Um, and then, um, yeah, it would, we, we need to talk about what, what is in tier two right now in our bill. It is um, related to a change in subdivision of the current standards. And so I think in light of sort of saying, well, if we're not quite ready to do tier three, how are we protecting or you know managing those resources in the larger part of the state. Um, and I, you know, I wanna have that conversation. And the road rules, you work on the road rules. And road rules, yeah. Would be interior too. Um, Representative Sibelia and Smith. So <clears throat> if we were to add um, new criteria and uh, we were to bring over um, what's being contemplated in the river corridors and wetlands bill, and we were to add the uh, road rule as all jurisdictional triggers, what would be missing from what is contemplated here in uh, the definition of uh, tier three in terms of a jurisdictional trigger? So what wouldn't we have as a jurisdictional trigger that is right now under critical resource area? So when I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we're actually uh, if we would be not doing tier three in name or in practice here. I'm not if we're doing the same thing by putting in place the criteria and river corridors ones. If that's oh, clear, oh, a lot would be different. It would be a lot of very much similar to the jurisdiction we have today came out of the vast majority of the states, depending on if we make changes to it, which I will also propose. <clears throat> so the definition that we have in 50, which I think I've just heard you say, which is tier proposed tier three, um, that we would have actually a process for that, um, have that be mapped is one thing, <clears throat> which uh, I, that sounds better to me. Um, but if we were to add these criteria, these new criteria, what's the difference? The, well, if, if we don't change the current jurisdictional trigger, then it would be kind of a status quo, but for obviously um, the review of impacts. So adding a criteria, but not changing the trigger. We are contemplating a road rule mm -hmm. and we are contemplating uh, changing the kind of density trigger for Act 250. So the difference is in trigger versus criteria. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So that would be just helpful 
have that kind of mapped. Representative Smith, and then okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't know who to ask this question to anybody, but I talked a little bit about the other day about the possibility of someone owning a piece of land with a brook that's dammed up with, by beaver population. If the dam raises itself three feet and takes away the property owner's land, does that land become wetland and he can't rid of the beaver dam? to put it back to what it was where he was going to build a camp or something along that line. So there's, there's a lot of beaver population that's increasing wetlands yep. constantly. Yep. Um, from our current reality, they are being increased. I would say the answer that you heard from uh, the witness, I think I agree with, which is it's likely a wetland today if the beaver is damming it. Um, and there is a, def a functional definition of what a wetland is that I don't want to try to quote off the top of my head right now. Um, but that's like we define wetlands based on function in the state of Vermont, and that would be a question for our wetlands ecologists. So is, don't you think that that's something that property owners should know prior to this being approved I mean, or I, disapproved? I don't think this affects them. It this, I mean, it doesn't change their situation, but that's probably a wet spot and they probably don't want to build on it. Well, I can give you an example, and I think I should. Uh, there's a beaver pond all oh, half a mile from my camp, and it's pretty well filled right now. There's a slope of fir that is not cedar or alders or anything like that, that if that beaver dam was increased or was built another two feet, it would impact the fur, uh, where someone could potentially build a camp if they wanted to. Is Act 250 going to get involved if they want to cut that beaver dam down to where it was and cut a spot where these fir trees were standing to build a camp? Are they going to have to jump through hoops? Does anybody follow me on this? Yeah, I mean, it, I um, would say not no, but I also would wonder if someone wants to build anything that close to something that potentially could flood again. Plenty of property owners need to manage beavers around their houses now. Yeah. So it's not changing that. This is not changing. Okay. Thank you. Representative Louie. Thank you. Um, I guess my, I'm trying to just clarify, following up on the questions that people have been asking, um, if we, Basically, it sounds like what you're suggesting is that we put in a framework for tier three and that um, the jurisdictional trigger wouldn't be implemented until the mapping process is, is done. And so then if we, is that right? Not exactly. I mean, I think the mapping process would be underway and then integrated into our our local and regional planning processes. Mm -hmm. And then the sort of the definitions of what are the critical resources that would be an Act 250 trigger would be simultaneously be worked on separately. So would we just delay? that definition coming into effect until that's done? Or would it become a criteria now, just waiting to be filled in, or? No, we'd, be, we'd get a, like a report back on what a critical resource of jurisdictional threshold would be. So in a way, we all we'd be doing is asking for that, and then we come back and try to figure out how to integrate it into statute then. Right. Right. In other words, we don't talk about what critical resource means to be able to enact. So I think we know enough about what a critical resource means, but we are having a hard time with um, how it gets translated into a jurisdictional trigger. I would I would say that's like that's where we're at. <laughs> Just to add to um, this conversation and things to think about with tier three, um, something that I will be looking for is really a robust public education mm -hmm. 
engagement process around this. Um, this is um, likely not an insignificant amount of the landmass in Vermont. And uh, I think it's really important that we make sure that we bring Vermonters along with us and their communities in why we are doing this, how we are doing this, when we are doing this, um, if we actually want to do this. I think failure to do that is probably going to be difficult to get anything passed. Yeah, I mean, we heard from the planners about how they do, do their outreach, how they work with the planners when they're doing this kind of mapping. Um, and I think that what we can do best is support our towns in doing their work so that they can do good outreach. Yeah, I would disagree that that is adequate. And I think um, we'll be asking for us to have a more significant public engagement process as part of whatever we pass. Um, I would like to continue our conversation here. All right, so back to... Uh, oh, are we going back to page 48? Yeah. Yeah. I'll let you. Well, go ahead and um, Okay, um, so I was reading from page 48 into page 49, which is on the regional a plan map review by the board for um, tiers one B and three. So, another question, Representative Morris. Thanks, thank you, Madam Chair. So, I, I know we have this uh, bolded clause in here, approved with conditions. And the other day, Tuesday, I believe it was, we heard from some towns that perhaps uh, don't necessarily agree with the regional planning commission. So. There's there's some gaps there, perhaps, in, in uh, what the plans are trying to identify. And this here uh, is the board, the ERB, uh, perhaps having issues with regional plans. So is that what this is intended to do? Is that we could approve a plan, but there's these conditions that you haven't been met, and that would translate the same with the RPCs to the towns that and I know we have a process for working out the plans, but you don't want to hold up a whole plan, regional plan or a town plan, if there's just a couple of minor adjustments required. Yeah, I mean, I would anticipate that the board and will be in touch. The RPCs and the board will have communications about, like, it's not going to be um, all of a sudden we're bringing this plan in. It's a surprise to the board what's in the plan or vice versa. And I, I guess I would say we don't think you can both have accountability and then not expect some disagreement. Right. So I, I think that's part of uh, holding government accountable. So I think we are headed to taking out that. Take, take, Conditional piece out. of it, yeah. What if we did? What would be, would there be a process for approval? Or, yeah, I think what what happened is that the uh, board, number, number one, I think it's unlike the original commission is going to submit something that's not going to get approved because I think they're not going to want to send it in and have it disapproved. That doesn't look good. So I think if, it's, if the process gains clarity over a, a little bit of time, that uh, by the time something goes in, it is very likely to get approved. But it's that this the way it would work without this is that they would send it back saying, effect, I'm making this up, but you know, you're 95% of the way there just to A and B and we submit, it'll be fine. Um, so that, and that could happen relatively quickly. But I think what, what this gets us away from is the board having to, having to become an enforcement enforcement <clears throat> to make sure that then they actually do the the things that they said they have to do because getting the once you get the stamp of approval, it's a little bit different than getting it all right than getting the stamp. But I don't think it'll. I don't think it would slow things down by. No, I, I don't think that my intent was it would slow it down. It's just because you don't. No, I know you. I know, yeah, I know you. I know what you. Yeah. So I, I would suggest we get the approval with conditions. Another yeah. Sibelia. Yeah. Uh, so. Noting that there was a suggestion there, um, I was going to ask about 
uh, Representative Bondas comment that we were heading towards changing this. I just want to make sure that I understand the process for the next rounds of edits. So I guess there's a question about whether or not there's consensus on this or is Representative Bondas changing this based no, on I'll, his I'll perception no of what the committee is. That my sense was to be consensus. Will we be going with your sense or will we be having confirmation from the committee? Do you disagree with, do you want to leave it in? Yeah. I guess I would just like to know what the committee's sense is. And I hope that as we're moving forward on this bill, which we would like to see passed, that we're being really clear about what the committee changes are. Do members have further comments on whether we have approved with conditions in on line 17? Representative Stallman. I thought I understood where the conversation was going with regards to what approve with conditions means, which means if a plan is 95% of the way there, but a few more things need to be tweaked, then it could be approved, assuming that those conditions are met. So with that language, it, that to me sounds like a reasonable process. So I guess I'm, I'm not quite now, assuming that I understood that correctly, I'm not quite now understanding why you're suggesting to strike it, because that kind of made sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, so can you explain to me your thinking some more? By the way, this is not a huge deal one yeah. way or the other. This is not, this is almost, it's almost, it's the slap. It is really not. We can, I will, and but, I will caution like that we're spending a lot of time yeah. on things that are really minor and that we should be focused on the larger aspects of this bill. But we can finish this conversation, but I do really hope that we can keep it. And again, I really, in the end, it's not a big deal, but I just think it would be, and I took pick up on Tom's uh, language, just be cleaner. But because if you, because what you're doing when you approve with condition is you're putting the stamp of approval on it and saying, but you also have to do A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And if for some reason they then have a hard time getting to A, B, and C, you've kind of created a bit of a mess because it's approved, but it's really not approved. And it's cleaner just to say, just to send it back saying, you're almost there, just do these and send it back to us and we'll approve it. And so by the time you get, to, when you get the stamp, it's done. I guess, I guess the distinction is a condition requires the board to follow up on it and we're asking the board to do a lot. Okay, I thought I was hearing the uh, folks who do this every day say that the language as it's currently drafted reflects sort of what they do currently, but no, with less was, with less specificity. That was a different process. That was Chris's downtown, right. which has nothing to do with this. Yeah. Um, so. Representative Smith and then we'll... what I see here is where <laughs> where it says approval of conditions. It's an approval, but you're looking at it through some clouds. So yeah. that that could cost somebody a lot of money up to that point and when he gets his approval well maybe i can't get this part of it done so i, I don't like approve with conditions um i think i think i don't like it i'm gonna just say tom kennedy and then chris Cochran. oh to put too fine a point on this we're creating somewhat of a mess saying we can approve regional plans with conditions and we can't approve town plans with conditions and the towns are not going to like that. And it's but it's the way these things work is there's lots of communication during the process. You're usually not surprised when you submit your plan because you have been communicating with the people beforehand. And I would imagine in this process that you're defining now, there was going to be an administrative person who's going to be reading through these things and they're going to talk about weaknesses in your plans. But I, I see no reason for approval with conditions. Because you're going to then have to, like I said, you're going to start getting into marginal issues, and it's going to create a mess. So we're used to it. We're used to yes and no. Representative Path, uh, oh, sorry, Chris Cocker, did you have more to add? I would, I would just echo what Tom's saying. I mean, well, I added that my board is allowed to do these conditional approvals from a practical standpoint. It's a pain in the butt because you have to continue to monitor and you have to continue to enforce. Representative Path. That's uh, the reason this sort of flagged when I asked my question earlier was was that um, uh, it's it's really it it doesn't say I mean there's some assumption that there is communication and that it might be a minor condition it doesn't say that it could be a, a huge a, a, a significant uh, condition and there's no way of once it's approved with conditions as I understand it 
there is no process for then checking whether the condition was met uh, and then what happens if it, if it wasn't. So I, I just think it's a process issue that, that is cloudy. So uh, if I may, thank you, Chair, for letting me take four more minutes to understand this. And I'm fine if we strike it. Does anyone object to striking it? Approve with conditions on line 17. I see no objections. I'd like to move on. Representative Sebelia. Uh, for moving on, uh, on page 49. I didn't read 49 yet. Well, okay. Then let me just wait for you. <laughs> yeah, I'm on line three on page 49. Well, I'm also on line two. Oh, okay. So one and two. Um, <clears throat> so if requested by the Regional Planning Commission, the board shall complete this review concurrently with the regional plan approval. So again, not being a land use planner, having gone through this process, can you help me understand when else this would happen? So we're basically saying these can happen concurrently or not. Right, so I wanted to sort of take a step back and do big pictures. So what's already in this bill, which is on the next page, is that you have been previously talking about approval of a planned growth area. So like one tier 1A, um, and I do think last week you were discussing whether or when, if there should, if these things should happen at different times, because this section is about 1B and 3, but depending on where you make a decision. So should this all happen at the same time? Potentially. Um, but this is separate. I think this is separating out for clarity that there are two different standards. So you could consider having this all in the same statute if you want. It was previously, but it's been pulled out to add some additional language here. So um, part of that is a style choice, I think. Um, is there an advantage or disadvantage? Does it add clarity or complication, you know, when doing it together or separately? I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, tier 1A will have more, is a full exemption. Tier 1B is going to lead to an exemption for a specific number of housing units under Act 250. Um, and so somebody else in the room might know more about if there's an an advantage. I don't know. I, I don't know. I haven't fully digested that yet. I think we need to get through some of the rest of the language to understand how it's all going to fit together. So. Yeah. All right. So on page 49, line three. So the board shall review the portions of the future land use map that include downtowns or village centers, planned growth areas, and village areas to ensure that they meet the requirements under 24 VSA 5804 and 5805 for designation as downtown and village centers and neighborhood areas. These portions of the future land use map shall be referred to as tier 1B for the purpose of jurisdiction under this chapter. So um, I did, I bolded that. I'm, I'm still, uh, we're making the plane as we fly here a little bit. So I wanted to check if that was your intent. I think this is combining some of the pieces that are at the end of the bill about the new designations. Yeah. I mean, I don't, um... We're, we're contemplating that towns need to actually be proactive in wanting to be a tier 1B, not that it's automatic. So I don't think we want to conflate them. So just to be clear, it's if the town, has, if, the, if the town says yes, then it's automatic, assuming they've met the, but they have to put, you want them to um, doubt, basically. Town want. Well, we the last language we looked at was the town had to seek it. Right. And so this is the language that was proposed by the planners at all. And this is pulling out that the RPC map will be reviewed. And so for tiers 1B and 3, it will be coming from the regional plan application, not necessarily the municipal plan application. Okay. Here we the theory being that we didn't want to have the board have to look at every 1B application 
because of the because really it's pretty simple um, plan zoning ordinance water or sewer or appropriate soils and um, and if they meet those and the town the town would the regional map would show that they meet them but but what we do want to have I, if I understood it right, was a a requirement that the town say yes we want to be checked as a one B. Yeah, at the very least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So that's what I think we're trying to or maybe trying to get to. It's simple, but town has to just do the check. Yes, I want to be we want to be one big. Um Okay, so then let's review what the is in this section. So to obtain a tier 1B base growth area designation, and this phrase base growth area has been added um, under the section, a regional planning commission shall demonstrate to the board that the municipalities with a tier 1B area, with tier 1B areas meet the following requirements as included in 24 BSA 4348AA12C. The municipality has a adop uh, duly adopted and approved plan and a planning process that is confirmed in accordance with 4350. The municipality has adopted permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws. Unless the municipality has adopted flood hazard and river corridor bylaws applicable to the entire municipality that are consistent with the standards established in uh, 10 VSA 755B, which is flood hazard area, and then 1428B, which is river corridor. <clears throat> the area excludes identified flood hazard and fluvial erosion areas, except those areas containing, onto page 50, pre-existing development in areas suitable for infill development as defined in the, the flood, hazard, flood hazard area and river corridor rule. The board shall review the portions of future land use maps that include rural conservation areas to ensure they meet the definition of critical resource areas in section 6001 of this title. These portions of the future land use map shall be referred to as tier pieces of jurisdiction. You just explain. Yeah, so the regional plan map will, will go to the board and the board will be under this section be reviewing tier 1B and tier 3. So tier 1B needs to have it needs to be identified on the map as part of the downtown village center, planned growth area and village area. And then they also need to be, uh, have an approved plan, permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws, and then either have adopted flood hazard and river corridor bylaws or exclude those areas from their tier 1B. And then also the regional map shall have mapped rural, conser rural conservation, and that shall be their des designated as their tier three areas. Um, I guess I'm a little confused by uh, the, if, if you have a river quarter flood hazard, river quarter bylaw, or you're avoiding it, I get, I get those two. But the third one, except those areas containing Pre-existing development in areas suitable for infill. How would you know that if you hadn't done your river corridor planning work? And it says Vermont is it river corridor rule? What is what is that referring? To? Well, so this is what's currently in for the NDAs, I believe. And so if <clears throat> if the well, I don't I don't know how to answer the the question you just asked, but if the town doesn't have bylaws, they are covered by the state flood <clears throat> And that identifies areas suitable for infill development. They're covered by it for purposes of Act 250? No. When does it come up? When would the state be involved in river corridor review that under a rule that doesn't have any other state jurisdiction triggered. Did I look for help on this question? Because so I mean, I, 
Is this your language? Um, it's not our language, um, but it's based on like for the NDA program that um, if a community had um, you know flood protection consistent with ANR's bylaws, <coughs> the process um, to get the bylaws approved, infill was allowed, and this is currently allowed in their their river rules. They allow infill so long as it doesn't create it worse for anybody else. So. Um, and we, I think we've had these conversations several years ago. <laughs> and I may be wrong, but I believe there is state jurisdiction in river quarters only for a very, very small subset of like um, you know, municipal projects. Um, I think it's a very, very narrow list of, of things that do get captured where the state is not too big. But this, this has sort of two different things. And yeah, I get the, the bylaw part of it, which is what you just said, but then it has this, this sort of thing, except those areas attaining existing development in areas suitable for inbuilt development as defined. And so we need to read 29-201, the flood hazard area and river corridor. Is that, is, that, is that a rule reference or a statutory reference? It's a rule reference. Why is it? And so it, um, suitable for infill development is defined in that rule. Is that what we passed last year? No. Uh, Two to three years ago. I think it was S thirty four or seven two years ago. Thirty seven cents, right? Yeah. But yeah, it was a couple of years ago. I wonder where we allowed infill development in flood hazard areas as long as it did not make it worse for somebody else. Huh. Oh, that worked out. I don't remember it. <laughs> I mean, you may want to reconsider you know, this is something you want to do. Thank you. So what we're saying here is that you can include areas that are suitable for infill development in your tier 1B map, basically. And I guess... I've been listening, but I still need to clarify exactly how those areas that are suitable for infill development are authorized. Who authorizes if it's not part of uh, the current municipal plan? So we need more information on that rule, I guess. Uh, Chris Cochran. Yeah, Rob, could, Rob from um, Reverse Program is probably the person who I talked to, but I, an example. It helps the committee. Chris Cochran from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, and Montpelier has a large, you know, flood hazard. It was flooded recently. Um, um, it's a managed channel. It's the river corridor is a, you know, an armored channel. Although there were areas will be flooded there, but I think if you look at the transit center, it was designed to be <clears throat> high standard. So it was flooded. There was really minimal effect to the building of it it up so it's allowing safe infill in these areas where um where we have the infrastructure where it can be built that's the intent but who allows so the a so a and r would have to review the community's bylaws make sure that they meet their standards ensuring that buildings are built to a flood safe standard um to allow that to happen and today i would add that nobody no community is as um use this option, um, but it's an option, I think, ah. <laughs> given the infrastructure we have in, in place in these locations, and there are ways to build resilient um, that does not affect downstream properties. Representative Sevilla. Yeah, uh, this conversation is bringing me to a couple of the broader needs that I have on my list, um, <clears throat> including kind of just an overall process map uh, for what's happening here in the bill. Um, process map for development of each of the tiers in here that we're proposing, uh, and then a process map for town and regional plans, which, you know, as we're going through this, it's sounding like we're adding up a lot more um, complexity, a lot more entities. Uh, so there's that. Uh, and There also the language here in uh, C. It sounded funky to me. Just 
fitting together. I don't know if it's. Unless the land shuts it down. Unless the municipality has adopted flood river, flood hazard or river bylaws applicable to the entity that are consistent with the standards established. Pursuant to this title, unless the municipality has adopted, the area excludes. So these are exceptions. The area excludes by flood hazard, except those areas. I'm not. It just feels not right language. Um, Does it all get clarified if we do the river corridor permitting process? I don't know. Um, and then, um, I had a question. Um, well, I, I'm going to actually just pause for a second and say, then I, I would like for you to follow up with Michael O'Grady and sort of talk that through, figure out the answer to the question, how it will it really, if he's the one doing that bill. I am in contact with Mike. This bill is evolving every day, and so is that bill. So I'm in contact. I'm saying that we have a question yeah. right now on the draft we're looking at, and I'm asking you to follow up on it. That's okay. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Next question. Uh, yeah. D. What's that? Yes. Uh, in D, uh, I have a question just around rural conservation, around rural conservation areas and critical resource areas. So just thinking about language and regular Vermonters ability to follow along. So what is the difference between those two things that's proposed in this bill? Between what? Rural conservation areas and critical resource areas. So in this bill, later in this bill, they are defined to be the same thing. So why... What is the advantage of referencing? So later in the bill, where you establish the sections of category, there's a establishing a categories that should be used on the future land use maps. So one of the categories that has been identified by the planners is rural conservation. Whether or not that's what you want to call it, that is up to you as policymakers. But it, they have identified as that is what they would map as tier three. This is from the VAPTA proposal. Yeah. Or VAPTA, not proposed proposal yeah. study. Yeah. So this is just saying that the review pro there is no the, the review process for design designating tier three, the board would review the critical resource area definition and see if it lines up with how they have mapped rural conservation areas. And that's all that's included here as the designation requirement. So I guess that's to make sure that it meets def definitely. I'm, I'm just wondering, not just wondering, I am not clear why this is necessary if they mean the same thing. Because it's two different programs. Okay, help me there. All right, so we had these big report, these three reports that came out. So this is trying to get the NRB report to talk to the planners report. The planners are trying to streamline their maps to have all the same language yep. and then use those maps to be a part of the tier system under Act 250. Thank you. That's really helpful. And also, as a hand gesture, I just want to express my gratitude for that. Well, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a graphics or map person, so that's probably the best you're going to get out of me. <laughs> okay. The doesn't wouldn't doesn't this section need to have doesn't say anything about having sewer or, or water or sewer? No. I think that we have that elsewhere. Or is that okay? You be, I mean you can add it. This is what the planner the the group <laughs> Yeah, you know, we we've thought landed on water or sewer. Yeah, water or sewer. It's water like, or sewer. Yeah. Or appropriate sports or adequate soils. soils. Yes. yes. Requiring water or sewer. But yeah. appropriate soils. Yeah. Water or sewer or appropriate. Yeah. Yes. Wow. We're taking testimony on both. And
Um, so I'm not a wastewater person. Who makes the determination that soils are appropriate for wastewater? Yeah, what does that mean? Appropriate soils. Does that mean they have to have a community septic designed? What are we what are we really saying there? So that I mean or testing the, the site. Beyond that's why I think we say they need to have water or sewer, then they've done that. They would be demonstrating that they've done that. It, instead of saying soils, which we've uh, taken a lot of tests for the lack of ability of soils when it relates to other areas of interest. Um, so all of a sudden we're gonna say the soils map looks great, then they can go. Representative Sebelia. Just uh, another flag here from my kind of overarching um, questions. So if we were to pass this historic legislation, uh, thinking about the timeline and thinking about how many towns we want to be certified, um, I'm not sure that we have taken testimony on kind of the timeframes that are happening right now in terms of from a in terms of permitting for um, municipal systems, um, how long that is taking. I think that would be really important for us to understand um, representing uh, small towns that have been trying to go through that process and engineers that are trying to help communities get through that. Uh, my understanding is there's a pretty significant backlog. So I wanna make sure that we understand that considering the hopes and dreams of so many tier 1A and tier 1B that we understand how long it might take to qualify to get in there if you don't have water or sewer. And I don't think we've taken testimony on that in the timelines for why so we're halfway? Um, no, we're not. We haven't taken text on each. I don't. Anyway, um, I think we want to include water or sewer in this list. Next draft. Representative Cecilia. Yeah, I, I, I do not. I would like to hear more about water and sewer first and like the timeline and the appropriateness of the soil. So maybe I'll throw it Water and sewer. Okay. Representative Stephanie. Uh, this is backtracking a little bit, which may not be, maybe we flag it for later, but um, I've never really loved the idea that it's okay to do infill in a like river floodplain area. Um, <laughs> So my question is, do we know if any projects have been built and if they've flooded since we passed that law a couple of years ago? Like, do we have any data that we could look well, to? But Mr. Cochran just said that no one's used it. I was asking our ledge council to bring back more information From on it and to understand how it's related to legislation that we're going to hopefully keep moving on this okay. session. So I feel like we're going to get more clarification on that. I hope we're going to get more clarification on that. Um, Great. Does anyone else object to including water and sewer, water or sewer, as a base requirement for Tier 1B? It's mentioned in the regional plan report section as being necessary yes. for the designation. So it seems like we're double stating things and we here. need to thank you for that we'll keep track of that as yeah, we hopefully keep moving list, through the bill yeah there's a whole list of things in the regional planning section that seems like it should be in here potentially yep we thought we we thought we were fixing some of that in this latest draft but yeah you got to get through it to see right absolutely and i'm sorry just hearing your concern about getting through the bill not to be asking questions this morning you can ask questions. I mean, we're, we're spending a lot of time on things that have um, been talking about a long time in some instances and um, are really quite small in others. So I'm cautioning us to keep moving. Sorry? So are we going to be meeting at night? I'm here all night actually working on this bill, reading up on the statute. So I'd be happy to work with folks at, in the evening. You can my chair. I'm sorry, wait a minute. Representative. Um, so the, the water and sewer piece, um, I, I am 
I'm a little worried that we've heard um, uh, a desire to make it more doable for towns to be 1B. And um, so that to me would make me think that we should keep water, sewer, and soil. On the other hand, we've also heard quite a bit about how many issues we've had with soil uh, and with waste management. So I don't know where I am on that right now. Right, so we're suggesting putting it here in large part because Representative Logan pointed out there may be things that need to be here that are not and things that are in other places that need to be here. It's another draft, we're trying it on, and I would suggest that I think 94 towns or something have a um, sewer treatment plant. So it's uh, a lot of towns. Representative Logan. Thank you. Isn't the, so like, what's the purpose of having water or sewer? It's essentially to be able to handle the additional capacity of building up to X number of housing units. Right. Can we just say sufficient? Some like wastewater management resources or something like that. I think that's the point of saying water or sewer. It's giving some flexibility for a village that only has a water system to yeah. find a place to dispose of the sewer, or a village that only has a, a treatment facility to dig a well. I think we're providing that by saying water or sewer. And I think. Um, Representative Tory. Um, I'm okay with water or sewer because it is complicated when you get into the soil thing. It's not just soils that can be the rate limiting step. It's also political will. <laughs> Somebody willing to, if the only pr private land is the only option, they don't want to do it. Um, but I do, I wouldn't want towns that are aspirational about 1B to not get resources because, you know, so this goes back to the designation piece like would they still have because right now I know a lot of towns are getting help doing the soil testing and uh, I wouldn't want them to lose that because by not being 1B they but 1B is sort of the end the the, the steps through the through the yeah. designation and ACCD process are those supports right. to help communities who would like to do more so just just because some of these designations are new in this bill so just walk me through so it would be a village center might still have access to those resources because they're a designated village center. Or if they were to create an NDA, they might have access to resources to do the soil community sewer planning. Yeah, so we walked through that list of steps, one, two, three, kind of different that, that are part of the ACCD process. We're gonna yeah. get to that in the bill. Okay. Yeah, that's my only flag. Just as long as the ACCD piece is still um, going to help towns ladder up and water and sewer, water or sewer is fine. Yes, it, <clears throat> Representative Spielberg. Yeah, just really a, uh, understanding the time frame from you know start to finish for a town uh, to qualify for this is one concern that I have and. A second concern that I have, I have a community that has been wrestling with this issue and that has gone with uh, kind of a commercial uh, uh, sewer, uh, a, a large scale tank for their, so I don't know if that would qualify or not for their village. Uh, so wanting some more detail on what that, what that means or understanding where I could learn about what saying they have to have sewer or water means what is sewer defined as is water all right let's take a break till quarter past the hour all right we're going to reconvene our meeting and continue walking through h687 draft 4.1 all right so um on page 50 into page 51 so this is the language that we previously have reviewed on the planned growth area designation, which is tier 1A. Um, and so there are a couple of small changes here to reflect that tier 1B was given its own statute in the prior section. So like on line 13, it just has been changed so that it's for the area as opposed to 
the areas or something equivalent to that strikes the reference on line 16 to tier 1b. And then there's new language on page 51 in the requirements for what a municipality has to demonstrate to get the tier 1a designation. So it's adding um, language in, that's part of subsection C. So the municipality has to have flood hazard and river corridor bylaws applicable to the entire municipality that are consistent with the, st the standards established in 755B and 1428B of this title, or the proposed plan growth area excludes the flood hazard areas and river corridor. So that's uh, slightly simpler language, but similar to what's on the prior sections. Um, on page 52, I why 24 VSA on line 17 of 51 is highlighted. Yeah, so, and that's similar to what's on the next page. I'm going to have to it's hold it. I, I have to line up all the cross references when you finish this bill. Um, and so, depending depending on what you decide, that section might be repealed. So that's in the existing Chapter 76A. Um, but the language for smart growth principles is added to the new Chapter 159. So if you go with that structure, I'll need to fix that cross-reference. And the same for the, on the next. There's actually at least one more on this page, too. And on the next page, the cross-references will need to be updated. Um, cool. So. That that was for me to sort of keep track of too, but also the other thing we I could do is try rewriting. Um, well, I need to think through how you're going to do the the designated area hand handoff sort of. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Um. And then, so on page 52, I'm not sure the smart growth principles are in chapter 117. I think they're actually in chapter one, uh, chapter 76A, so I was going to check that cross-reference. Um, and then, again, 2792D uh, would be repealed, so I'd have to cross check that cross-reference. Um, but then there's new language on page 52 regarding the wildlife bylaws. And so this is these are, again, the requirements for what a town has to have to have the Tier 1A designation. And so this is adding on line 11, wildlife habitat planning bylaws for the planned growth area that protect significant natural communities, rare, threatened, and endangered species, and river corridors, or exclude these areas from the proposed planned growth area. Um, and so this is adding a little more, I think, specificity to what would be included in the wildlife bylaws. Or is that any questions? Representative Bonger. In the previous draft, there was <clears throat> language to the effect that fish and wildlife would uh, <clears throat> yes. develop the model bylaws, or I forgot how that worked, but wouldn't that, would that? I guess the question is, would that still be helpful to communities? Because otherwise, how do we really, who's going to determine whether they've set this standard? I guess the board would. Yeah. But, so actually, I withdraw it. I think I've yeah. got to have to answer my own question. <laughs> At least good. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. So maybe this goes along with what you were just said, up, but who designates the the threatened and endangered species? Who would designate? The Department of Fish and Wildlife has a process for listing species on that list. Okay. So, actually, the process we heard a lot about yesterday. Okay, so they would have to, someone wanted to do this 
the planned growth area. Okay, so they would be called in by the the planning commissions, or what triggers that? Um, so they just they would have to have um, bylaws in the area that protect species. So if any of them occurred there, there'd have to be. Uh, that have to be addressed in the bylaws what would happen and so what what would happen is that the the state has jurisdiction over that and and has permit authority already um but i think the intent of this section is to sort of backfill the act 250 criteria that requires projects to make sure they're not negatively impacting these species either okay for now i guess is that, are you good yeah for now um, and so then, um, also on page 52, the requirement I, uh, I'll read you this. So I'll, let me just read through this and I'll discuss. Permit, uh, they, the town needs to have permitted water and wastewater systems with the capacity to support additional development within the planned growth area. The municipality shall have adopted consistent policies by municipal plan and ordinance on the allocation, connection, and extension of water and wastewater lines that include a defined and mapped service area to support the planned growth area. So the planners uh, requested having these mapped, and I think this has come up actually in past years that um, not all of the towns have mapped where there's, their lines are, and that could be very helpful. Um, so. That's being added here. I did want to just mention, in addition, on the next page, so in the prior drafts, what you had for Tier 1B has been struck out, and it included that language in I, as was sort of brought up by Representative Logan, that it was left out, and then also um, adequate municipal staff was also included in your prior draft. So back to what you were talking about earlier and and i don't think you had fully made decisions on if that was the complete list but the on page 53 on number two the yellow highlighted no it's not in service right so i just wanted to propose so there's a couple of there's some things happening here so uh the NRB report had a sort of outline of what Tier 1B would include, um, but then you have been working on your planned growth area designation, and so we're working on the list of criteria for Tier 1B. And so I do think that the NRB report had mentioned the water, sewer, soils discussion that you just had. Um, but I think, and you were asking what's the what else is missing. So I think the only thing that you had previously discussed for tier 1B was the municipal staff component. So if you're looking at page 53, your, the draft previously had the, 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 the municipality had to demonstrate A, E, I, J, and K. So uh, A is the uh, plan, the town, approved town plan. E is the permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws. I was that language I just read you about permitted water and sewer with the mapped lines. J is adequate municipal staff to support their zoning administration. And then K is approval of the regional plan. So that's what you had been contemplating. I wasn't sure if you had, you know, made that your definitive list, but because this draft is reflecting the proposal from the planners and others, I left this in here, but struck to show you that this is what you had previously. I think those are basic things that we want to have on required. I'm curious if the planners have up to you. Um, I know, I don't know how directly involved you've been in this, uh, Tom, but if you know the thinking behind this, that would be helpful. Behind J or what? Behind striking the requirements for 1B. We're moved to that section we were just talking about. They were moved. <clears throat> right. So they were moved to that section, but as you just discussed, what wasn't carried over was the wastewater water discussion. And the staffing. And staff. 
I think they're both necessary. Adequate staffing doesn't mean they have to have a planner. It means they need to have someone who can follow through on permits, a zoning administrator, or a, and lots of small towns have that. Um, the actual staffing can be helped. The actual staffing can be So I think that is one. So I think that might be one thing at play here is that the prior section is proposing that the regional plan actually be making the proposal for one B. So there might be a question of whether or not the regional planning commission has access to that information. It better. Or they better know their town well. They know their okay. towns well enough to know if they what what kind of planning and zoning staffing support they have. Oh yeah. Um, Representative Logan. Thank you. Um. So for section the new ten VSA section sixty thirty four here with the designation of tier one B, could we not just use similar language as we're using in section sixty thirty three? And refer to section 6033A, E, I, J, and K in section 6034 instead of referring to 24 VSA 4348A, A, 12C. Like, could we do yeah. that instead? Um, yeah, yeah. I can, I mean, I can draft it however. This is the proposal. Great idea. <laughs> yeah. It seems like <laughs> yeah. if it's internal it's an internal reference to the prior section i also could just list the things out yeah I think listing the things out make yeah. it way more accessible the same coverage the same, reader the same things that are here right Let's just list them out please that's a great suggestion okay. um and representative bonger if you the only thing i'll start about if, if you take mm -hmm. i Verbatim, and we would have to one day, then it's required for both student wars. We have to make sure so that's the question. Is yeah. just I need you, you need to decide on what it is you want the elements to be, and then I can just draft it. Adequate staffing should go back, I think, water or sewer should go, and actually, that should be mapped too. I right? yeah. think for one B, it would be so you would use the same language except just say water or sewer. That makes sense. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I think it makes sense to have a map that's pretty easy, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so I'm saying yes. Should be in the modern era, it should be. Yeah. yeah. And then we're calling tier one be a base growth area now. Instead of anyway. Wondering is it uh I here and map service area to support. Um page 49, line nine. I'm just wondering if we're going to move the language from page 52, letter I, or what the phrase in the last line would be to support the. Oh, I see. Base growth area. Base growth area. We can, we can keep trying that on. How does that sound? Yeah, yeah. sorry. That's That was a, a again, reference in the planners. Uh, proposal. So, I'll be putting that word based in there. Well, I think, yeah, they're just, I think, referencing the, 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 the idea that it could be a step towards a large a land growth area. Right. It's to distinguish it from a planned growth area. And I, I don't think there's any harm in distinguishing it. So, let's stick with it. Okay. Representative Logan. Okay. Follow up question. Um, so, now that we're here um what is this list of requirements for a tier 1b designation um is that is this different in any way from the nrb report is this well, so as i just said i think the only thing that they didn't call out specifically was adequate staff okay i think that's the only distinction but i can i'm i i that yeah, I I thought I had the report, but I don't think I do. So maybe they're gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they've been in the room when we've gone through the list a number of times. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, 
Trust that if they objected, they would bring it up. Let's keep going. Okay. So, um, so on page 53, still in the requirements for uh, Tier 1A, um, we had this conversation so briefly last week, but um, line 11 to 12, it came up in the section we were just discussing also how you want there to be an interaction between the designations with tier A, 1A and B. Like, so this is referencing in compliance with underlying designate, like designation for the designated areas. Um, so I don't know, didn't sound like you wanted that to be over, to be a requirement, but just flagging it. Is any and the designation program is changing too, so this is a little bit different now, potentially anyway. This number three is saying if they're out of compliance with the underlying. ACCD designation? I think so, yeah. So I'm oh. I don't know. Um, Chris Cochran, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, Chris Cochran. I, I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense because the, the mapping process is going to, you know, they're going to follow a definition. Where did this come from? I, I, we've had a lot of drafts. I can't remember. If it does refer to the designation program, we should just. That's what it is for the underlying designation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think we need that to be linked there. <clears throat> we can take that out. Does anyone object to taking it out? Not seeing any. Um, so then uh, next, so process for issuing determinations on the planned growth area designation. A pre-application meeting shall be held with the board staff municipal staff and the staff of the relevant RPC. Um, so that's having all three of these groups come together. Um, On to page 54, um, there is a proposal to strike um, Having the RPC establish a procedure for draft applications of the Tier 1A application. I have a minor, I hate to, hate to do this, but going back to the bottom of 53, say the meeting shall be held in the municipality unless another. Is this, is there a reason this couldn't be done? Over Zoom, just that's a, I mean that's a good point. Preliminary, <laughs> like, did you think about this? Did you think about? Um, Chris Cochran. This just picks up old language from the NDA program, so I I don't see any issue in modernizing it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be another location? Um, and I guess I, I mean, I do think that the main meeting, like, let's say in this current era should be in the municipality, but there's no reason that someone couldn't zoom into it. It's just the main, this is the pre-app meeting. This is the pre-app meeting. Is it a public meeting? No, I don't think so. Looks like it's a staff meeting. Maybe we could just say at the end or electronically. Or disagree. Yeah, you could strike the whole sentence, or you could say, you know, it's held in the municipality unless otherwise agreed. I I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think unless another location. Yeah. It never zoomed to me. But does it? Location is physical. 
Okay, so what would you like to propose? Yeah, just just or electronically. Or electronically. Yeah. That's all. How are we referring to those meetings these days? You know, electronically seems odd, but. Uh, I think electronically works. I mean, I don't, I don't. Um, There's a lot of rules lately around. Yes. That. We were using words for it. I'm just not, coming, not coming to me. So, all right. Duly noted, you can change that. Um, also, uh, on page 54, there's also a uh, line 17 proposal to strike, uh, 30 days advance notice. Um, to the municipality, which probably does make sense because the municipality is the one making the application. So they know. Oh. Yes, Smith. Thank you. I've seen notices go in papers like this, uh, say 30 days out. People forget all about it when it's time and they wish that they were able to attend the meeting, but they forgot about it. Is this possible to have a 30 day notice and a 15 day notice for meetings? Anything is. Because I don't know how many people come into a select board meeting and say, I forgot all about that because you posted it a long time ago. Um, I think that's a good idea. I agree with you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. 30 days and 15 days. Yeah. On page 55, down on line 14, so no defect in the form or substance of any requirements of this subsection C, which is this no, these notice provisions, shall invalidate the action of the board where reasonable efforts have been made to provide adequate posting and notice. However, the action shall be invalid when the defective posting or notice was materially misleading in content. If an action is ruled to be invalid by the superior court or by the board itself, the municipality shall issue new posting and notice and the board shall hold a new hearing and take new action. So uh, one, it's it's getting rid of the, the RPC from also issuing the notice because this is about the municipality's application. Um, but I did want to flag that we haven't spent much time talking about appeals or what an appeal means here. So this isn't specifically about appeals. This would be if somebody challenged in court that under this statute, the municipality hadn't followed the required procedure uh, for notice. So it would go to the superior court, which could be part of an appeal or it could be uh, part of a, a separate action, I guess. But you haven't really talked too much, I think, about what the appeal process is for these designated areas, so I did want to flag that. Right. Um, thank you for that note. I um, I kind of want to also go back just to page 54, line 17. Uh, I kind of think the Regional Planning Commission should also have to post that this is happening. I don't know that it needs to be 35 days in advance, but since they're, okay. they're like doing this with our towns, right? Mm -hmm. so, well, and their web page may be visited by different people. Is that a burden, um, Tom Kennedy? Like, does that make sense to you? Like, it just seems like it's the process of regional planning facilitating. Why wouldn't they post it? Sometimes it's um, coordination issues with the municipality. And so we could do things like put it on our own website and advertise it that way. But I think we also want 
the municipality to take ownership of of this process and not necessarily have it be the regional planning commission process because it is for the it's the municipality that's doing it. yeah and i totally agree it should be motivated by the municipality but i'm just thinking about uh, where people get information and who's got a web page that's i mean we certainly can put it on our web page uh as far as posting in a newspaper or whatever we'll probably use the same newspapers you know, unless it's a very large, a large region, but generally with the lack of newspapers or so on, we generally share similar papers. Or yeah, this one doesn't have the papers in it. It just says on uh, its website. But we can certainly do that. <coughs> and it's on its website. Uh, I, a little I too does say newspaper or general circulation. Right. Bottom. Right. When that's the town's requirement, and that I think we should keep. But Tom was concerned we were asking them both to put it in the newspaper, and I'm not. I'm just saying it's pretty easy to post something like that on a website, and people in the region might be interested if a town is applying for this, as well as people in that town. That's my only point. I think it's a big deal. Um, and then I think... <laughs> That um, Ellen, I think we'll look for that place to talk about the appeals, unless you know off the top of your head where that is. But to your point at the bottom of page 55. Um, so I think on at the bottom of page 56. So this is tier 1A, an interested person may appeal an act or decision of the board under this section to the Supreme Court within 30 days following the act or decision. And then the next page lists who those interested people are. So this does track with how you're doing the Act 250 appeals somewhat, which is an Act 250 appeal that's heard by the board. If there's an appeal from that, that goes to the Supreme Court. This is a little bit different. And so this is if the municipality is getting designated. Um, the appeal, you do have an appeal route. If the board makes a decision on that designation, that can then be appealed to the Supreme Court. So appeals of designations currently don't happen. So this is a change. Um, and then it does list on page 57 the people who are interested persons. Seems pretty straightforward to me. Is there okay. something of concern for our members on this process? Okay. Okay. Representative Logan. Thank you. Um, how, why, why 20 persons by petition? Um, I just reread H719 the other day. Um, you didn't work on H719. Yes, I did. Yeah, you did. Page four. On 57D. Oh, yeah. Any 20 D. people. Um, oh. and that had a much higher threshold for... Yes. 10% of the population. Not directly in... Yeah. Like a, a person owning title to or occupying property within or abutting the designated area makes perfect sense. But then it was, uh, what, 10%? Yeah, population. population. Population in the area from 719 would be required to sign on petition. Yes. And Senate Economic Development modified that to 3%. 3%? Yes. Because we talked about all the various populations of the towns in the state, which range from 64 to 45,000. So you had a very significant conversation over in Senate Economic Development about appeals processes? Yes, we did. Several. <laughs> Several. So I know that this has been something that people have been talking a lot about, uh, making it harder for a group of people who aren't directly impacted by the decision um, to um, have a petition. <coughs> That would, that would justify uh, them being able to appeal. Are you suggesting that we maybe use the, you can, if 
if economic development, Senate economic development came up with that after a lot of testimony, maybe we can align that. So but this, this is not like a particular development appeal. This is a designation appeal for a town. Right, but I, you could imagine it becoming somewhat uh, oh, this person, a person owning title to or occupying property within or abutting the designated area. Yeah, so you could imagine people having um, very strong opinions about the designations in their town, especially if uh, parts of the town aren't included in the 1A, the planned growth area, or are, and they think that they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Seems like we would want a large number of people from the community to agree that it needs to be appealed, not 20, including adjoining communities. So the other dimension that you want to consider with this issue is whether or not the, this group of people need to have participated in the hearing, which is, that is the last sentence here is that all of them need to have participated in the hearing. Um, at, in Title 24, participated means having provided written or oral comments at the public hearing. Um, and so Burlington has 45,000 people in it. If it was 10%, that would mean that 4,500 4, people would have needed to participate in the public hearing. Mm -hmm. So uh, economic development did add that um, not all of the percentage population had to participate in the hearing because physically that might not be possible. So if you're going to go to a percentage-based population, you need to consider that. But in the past, this participation requirement has been seen as a necessary requirement so that people raise their issues as soon as possible. So mm -hmm. if you go to a population base, you have to consider whether or not there's physically enough room in a space to hold 4,500 people, uh, or if there's multiple meetings held, or if there is a Zoom requirement that would even allow them. So there would have to be a structure in place for 4,500 people potentially to have weighed in at the public hearing in some way or you could not have that requirement. Uh, that is sort of why they landed at 3%, rounded up to the nearest whole person. Well, and this says the designated representative must have participated in the public hearing. Right, so- it Gets rid of that. No, but I'm also, yeah, right. But so that's the question, if you're talking about the Senate economic development language, that's your sort of option. So if you wanna leave it this way, you can, if you go to a population based, is that the same thing? Or do you want there to have been people weighing in at the public hearing in advance before they attempt to to appeal? Where does, do you know where this language comes from in our bill originally? Um, well, I think I suspect it's that I, uh, I suspect I copied it from the municipal existing municipal language. I don't. I don't remember if somebody or our used it. I think I probably. I no. So I suspect I copied it from the existing statute, but I actually don't know. Representative Bongar, to go out for a second. My sense has been, and maybe I'm wrong about this, that this would rarely happen. Yeah. That people are likely to appeal this. But maybe I'm wrong. Um, so I hadn't paid too much attention to which, to which way we should, we should do this. Um, there, having 20 people who have participated is a fairly high bar. Well, um, this is one person. No, I, I understand that. Yeah. But if we went one, I see, yeah. So the question would be whether we maybe do, so maybe, maybe we could frame the question. I would it make sense to frame the question as, 3% or 20 people who have participated in which makes more sense. And I don't know the answer to that. 20 is not enough for Burlington, which is why I understand. The, yeah. Um, and you're right, it's a lot it's, for a smaller. So the thing, yeah. yeah. I guess the thing is, though, a, a person owning or owning title to or occupying property within or abutting the designated area, that's a lot of, that's a lot of individuals mm -hmm. that can do this. Yep. You know, so I think if there's some sort of groundswell that they're gonna, anyone who wants to appeal could find that person. Anyway, so I, I think the 20 persons is like kind of, can't imagine in this situation. <clears throat> I 
they have to own or occupy within the municipality. In which or the designated area is located or, or an adjoining, an adjoining municipality. <clears throat> Yeah, so you're worried about crazy making or frivolous appeals. Yeah. The, that's uh, of, of the yeah. Friv I'm worried about uh I don't I just I'm trying to imagine yeah. all the possible scenarios. Uh um like next door neighbor municipalities having a problem with um, you know, some town becoming more developed that's next to their town or um I would imagine, I don't, I still don't entirely understand, like I can't entirely imagine what the planned growth area designation process is going to look like vis-a-vis -vis, like, tier three designation process, but you could admit, because I would think that the tier three areas would be carved out of the 1A designation maps, right? That's the idea. Um, I would imagine that becoming a contentious piece of the, like, people from an adjoining community maybe having a problem with how large the plant growth area is, or what if it includes or doesn't include, or something like that. I don't know, just frivolous appeals holding up the entire process. Sounds like it would be. So I think what I would ask is that um, we check what's existing statute and where this came from, and then we'll understand. Well, so there isn't currently any kind of process for any existing designations. No, I understand. Right. You said you might have taken it from existing municipal um, planning appeals, right? Yes. So let's, can we just check that, see what's there? Well, I just. Is that what this is from? Well, I don't know. So this language is not identical to what's in that statute. So I don't know if. I don't know how that language evolved. I don't know if that came out of conversations from earlier this fall or from one of the planning proposals. I, I don't remember, but it's similar to what's in statute for planning appeals, but not identical. It's in statute. So it's um, so last year you passed an amendment. So it's ten people that are either own property reside uh, reside or are voters within the municipality. Um, and they all have to have participated in the uh, hearing. So this is even more people than that. And then, and then we didn't have a the equivalent of a a single person owning title or occupying property. Right? It had to be at least ten people. No. So no. So there is an ex there is existing provision in the municipal uh, context for uh, an abutter, but they have to have demonstrated a um, potential uh, environmental impact to them. <coughs> So yeah, so the so in for appeals of municipal planning decisions, it's uh, a person owning property who alleges the bylaw or appeal uh, permit uh, imposes on the property unreasonable or in, inappropriate restrictions, uh, and then the next is the next interested person is the municipality or any municipality that adjoins that municipality. Uh, next is a person owning or occupying property in the immediate neighborhood of the property subject to the decision who can, who can demonstrate a physical or environmental impact on that person's interest under the criteria uh, reviewed. And then any 10 persons, uh, which any combination of voters, residents, or real property owners uh, who by signed a petition, uh, allege any relief requested, will not be in accord with the policies, purposes, or terms of the plan or bylaw, and then designate one person as a representative, and then they also need to have participated. There's also any a department or administrative subdivision of the state 
owning property within the municipality. Yeah, so just to make sure what we're doing so, this one. Yeah. In some ways, the, the yeah. decision that somebody might want to appeal would have been the map because the map is going to say, this is the area. And so all anybody would be appealing at this point, if I have this right, is the removal of active, in a way, the removal of active 15 jurisdiction. Um, I think, <clears throat> mm, well, so there's also that, that's that list of criteria on the bylaws that the municipality has to demonstrate that they have. So somebody could be saying, don't really have, they haven't really had that. Yeah. Even though the board had said. Okay. Yeah. It's great because an appeal then would, would be very technical actually, because they, they're saying there's seven things you have to do to 1A and you haven't met one, but it would be odd if the board in the meantime had said, yes, you do. It's, it's not like sometimes appeals are around like character carry and nebulous things. Right. This is a checklist. Yeah. Um, so it's. Yeah. It's, I mean, I guess I would also just add that anytime you create a new statutory regime, you, you will have vagueness that would get bear, borne out by litigation, right? So. While I do think it would be much less sub subjective than character of the area, um, you will have a board reviewing for the first time by bylaw sufficiency. So that might be an interesting process. Um, to move on, um, it's about 11 o'clock. We're going to shift gears, actually. I'm going to say we will be back with Ellen tomorrow afternoon and um, continuing our walk through. Representative Bongart. Could we come, would it be possible to come back after four? Today? Yeah. If it's short. Um, a, yeah. If four is short, I think we could do that. So I don't, I think there may be things on the floor, but it's a good suggestion. So current forecast at two hours. Uh, oh, air traffic say, control. Well, yeah. did you just say? They're saying, he said it's currently forecast to be a two hour. I have floor. a meeting in Newport at 6 30 that I need to be at. So okay. if I leave here at, at five, I'll be fine. So well, stay tuned. If the floor is short and okay. Ellen is available, I will make an announcement that we would come back. It's a good suggestion. We are going to start looking for more opportunities to keep going on this. We may end up working a little bit of extra hours. Um, Due to the time this is taking us. So, get over. Good. <laughs> um, for now, let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back and talk so, some. We'll start again. All right. We are actually going to invite Zach Porter to join us. We're going to shift gears and um, continue to hear a little bit more about the Worcester Range um, Long Range Management Plan. Thank you. Chair Sheldon and members of the committee, give me one second while I get off to me. We'll just see now it says I'm, oh, here we go. Like I'm in. You want to turn off the sound? Why are you okay? Go. So we have about we have four witnesses and a little bit less than an hour. So everyone will have you know something less than fifteen minutes. Oh, all right, let's jump in. Uh, can you see this presentation? Yeah. Yes, okay. Hey. Oh, 
Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again for this opportunity to visit with you. Um, I want to make sure that you all have the uh, the written testimony uh, that we submitted this morning uh, available to you. We also submitted our very detailed uh, comments on the Worcester Range Management Plan. Um, you say for the record who you are. And yes, thank you for the reminder. I'm Zach Porter. I'm Executive Director of Standing Trees. We're a uh, nonprofit based here in Montpelier that works on public land management issues around the six state New England region. Uh, but we focus here on Vermont and, uh, and, and neighboring New Hampshire. Uh, I'm a resident of Montpelier and um, the Worcester Range is, is my my neighborhood mountain range. Um, I live just up the North Branch here and uh, think every day about what the Worcester Range is doing for our community here. Um, and obviously we got to know the benefits of, of, of our uh, forests uh, last summer with the floods that we had uh, here in town coming within inches, as Representative Pat mentioned last uh, last week, uh, of engaging the spillway of Riceville Reservoir just downstream from the Worcester Range. So this is all very personal for me, in addition to being my, my professional work. So like I said, Standing Trees has been around for uh, just a few years um, and uh, working to organize uh, citizens across the New England region on public land issues and spend time with people like yourselves to learn more about the way public lands are managed. Um, so as I mentioned, the Worcester Range is, is Montpelier's uh, backyard. Very important place to this community, to me personally. And what I wanna talk to you today um, is about the ways in which Vermont's you know, very forward thinking uh, planning around, uh, you know, conserving biodiversity, addressing uh, climate change and, and, and climate mitigation, looking at, you know, how do we make our communities more resilient? We have, uh, you know, plans for restoring the water quality of Lake Champlain. And yet somehow we have not combined these efforts into a uh, kind of coherent, comprehensive approach to land management. We've got these disparate plans that are not being connected in the middle. And that's what a long range management plan should do is take all of these plans that you have directed our state agencies to complete in many cases and put them together, you know, put them into action on the ground. That is the job of a long range management plan. And to date, our long range management planning process in Vermont does not accomplish that goal of putting those pieces together. Um, addressing carbon in the atmosphere is a hugely important issue, as you all know. Um, but there are ways in which our land management decisions each and every day in the state actually have a much more direct impact on how we are going to handle the climate crisis than the decisions that we make related to putting carbon into the atmosphere. So whereas a lot of the focus is on carbon emissions, and, and justifiably so, what we are, I think, ignoring at our own peril a lot of the time are these shorter term decisions that are compromising our ability to adapt to this climate change future that is already here. In 150 years since most of Vermont was cleared, um, we have trees growing back on our landscape, but we don't have forests yet in any real ecological sense. Um, I think we take for granted that we, you know, we look out the window, we see green, we think we've got healthy forests because three quarters of Vermont has been, uh, you know, returned to forest over the last uh, century and a half. But we are so far still from fully functioning forest ecosystems. And again, the long range management planning process is a chance to think long term and big picture about forest health. And we're not doing that yet. The state of Vermont knows the value of the Worcester Range. In the uh, beautiful uh, report, An Enduring Place, Wildlife and People in the Worcester Range through the Northeastern Highlands, Vermont Fish and Wildlife says, the Worcester Range is the only place that's left in central Vermont that's large in scale and completely unfragmented. The Worcester Range is unique because it remains almost completely wild and undeveloped. So uh, it's not just me telling you the special nature of the Worcester Range, it's, the, it's, it's Vermont Agency of Natural Resources that knows full well. Zach Sagan, who the author of that report is. That was co-authored by Vermont Fish and Wildlife. And it was, uh, came out uh, sometime in the last decade or so, that report. Um, so what we have today is the very first comprehensive management plan for the entirety of the Worcester Range Management Unit. That has not been done before. And the, the plans that do exist date from the 1980s. So they, in, effect, you know, in, in essence, haven't been in effect. We haven't had a management plan. 
for all intents and purposes for several decades now for the Worcester. It has been sitting there doing its thing. It's, it's, it's naturally recovering its health and, and performing at a relatively high level in terms of ecosystem service production compared to most forested landscapes in Vermont because of this benign neglect. The Worcester Range Management Plan acknowledges these superlative qualities of the Worcester Range in multiple locations in the plan. The, the staff at uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife um, did a great job of, of calling out how valuable it is for its ecological, uh, for ecological reasons, for the age of the forest, um, and that it provides interior immature forest qualities that just aren't present in much of, of Vermont. So today, as you've heard from, from other speakers on other topics um, over the last several years, about 25% of New England and Vermont, more or less, is conserved from development. That's, an, that's a remarkable accomplishment from the land trust community and, and, and you know, speaks to the value of public lands. But only a very small percentage of that, 3%, is managed as wildlands today. The Worcester Range is a chance to uh, really set our, our best foot forward trying to realize the old forest goals in Vermont conservation design that you've heard about from Bob Zeno and others. Um, it's at this critical location in, in uh, North Central Vermont. The Worcester Range uh, is, you know, really this crossroads uh, for biodiversity. And as you can see here, we have a high concentration of state lands in, in the northern part of the state that are uh, really essential to maintaining, um, you know, the functionality of this greater landscape. So I want to dig into what are the statutory authorities of VTANR. You heard from Commissioner Fitzko last week about how they interpret their responsibilities. Um, I want to put a critical eye to what they told you. In a seven days article from January 24th, Commissioner Fitzko said to the people of Vermont that we have a logging mandate on state lands. This is something that was echoed in comments that were made by VTA and our staff at the two public meetings that were held for the Worcester Range Management Plan in Worcester and in Stowe. There is no logging mandate for state lands. I want to be really clear about that. 10 VSA 2603 says uh, that we may sell forest products from these lands. What we shall do is we shall promulgate rules for state land management. We shall protect communities from flooding, protect soil resources. Um, all of that is emphasized um, in the statutes. So as I just mentioned, um, it's the policy of the state of Vermont that floods, uh, soil erosion are alleviated, um, that an impairment of its dams and reservoirs is prevented. Um, these are the musts, these are the shalls of our uh, statutes. And today our long range management plans aren't living up to you know, what is expected of our, of our natural resource management agencies. In the draft long range management plan for the Worcester Range, there is literally no analysis of what that plan will do for flood resilience, none. There's also nothing about impacts to phosphorus loading in Lake Champlain. Zero mention of the Lake Champlain TMDL in this entire management plan. It's remarkable. It really blows, blows my mind, to be honest. So this, this 15,600 acre core block of the Worcester Range is the single largest functional wildland under state management today in Northern Vermont. It's, a, it's an amazing piece of, of real estate that we all own, it's our land and the state is entrusted with caring for it. There, about half of the, the Worcester Range management unit has been put into uh, lands that are available for timber harvest potentially in the future. And about 20% of that will be harvested over the first uh, management plan uh, time horizon, these, the next 20 years. That includes lands that were just acquired, just acquired with DEC uh, clean water funding. We'll be cutting in lands that were acquired for the purpose of water quality. And we'll be cutting in Elmore State Park. Half of Elmore State Park is opened up officially to timber harvest in this management plan. This is the 100th anniversary of the Vermont State Park System. And as far as I can tell, there is no difference in the way that we manage state parks today compared to the way that we manage state forests. This is also remarkable to me. So what else is missing from this plan? Um, the uh, Abenaki community members who I work with um, are really concerned about the fact that they have not been adequately consulted on this plan, um, that their voice is not here, that their history is not here. Um, that's a, a real uh, missing component of this plan. 
you all passed Act 59 last session, and Act 59 doesn't merely include an inventory, as you were told last week. You were told that Act 59, this is, this is compatible with Act 59, the management plan. Well, yes, the lands in the Worcester Range will fit into the inventory, but Act 59 is much more than an inventory, right? It directs the agency to conduct a plan. And specifically, it says, what is the role of state lands in meeting our ecological reserve goals and meeting our old forest goals in Vermont conservation design? That question hasn't been answered yet by the Agency of Natural Resources, right? They have to do that in the next year, is figure out what that role will be. So does it make sense to be putting forward this management plan for the next 20 years, really setting in motion management for decades to come before the Act 59 process is completed? I think that's a real a kind of breach of their moral obligation. The Global Warming Solutions Act requires emissions analysis for major agency actions. There is the word carbon shows up twice in this management plan. And there is absolutely no attempt at analyzing the carbon impacts of this uh, proposal. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the Lake Champlain TMDL doesn't appear in the document either. And as you are all uh, discussing, uh, HH12 is a, a bill that many of you have uh, co-sponsored in this committee. It's a great bill that looks at designating critical habitat. We have not yet designated critical habitat for species, endangered species that are present in the Worcester Range, like the Northern Long-Eared Bat, which was just uh, listed last year on the federal list. So. We know that the older a forest gets, the higher the output of ecosystem services. And in 2015, the state commissioned a report on uh, enhancing flood resiliency of Vermont state lands. And it found that AMPs just aren't cutting it. AMPs were not designed to handle floodwaters. This report has never seen the light of day. ANR commissioned this report. It has yet, yet to be cited in a management plan because they were concerned about its contents. Here's uh, records request that we uh, did to learn why this report um, hasn't been uh, used. And what we see here are FPR Forrester comments. Um, if flood resiliency was the highest or only priority for management, um, the concepts here uh, could be effective at increasing flood resiliency on state lands. But fully adopting the recommendations in this report, <laughs> state land silvicultural timber management program. Um, if flood resiliency is that critical and there's no other way to accomplish it, then that's fine. I just want to be sure that those who make the decisions on these matters understand the impacts it will have. I think there's a real sense in the agency that we they know that the way that things are done today isn't living up to the goals of the legislature, isn't living up to our, our you know, uh, the way that we need to know, know we need to exist in this landscape with, with climate change coming our way. But the system is broken right now. And that's what that's the message I want you all to hear is that there are good people working at ANR. You heard from them last week. But the system is pointing us to do things in this landscape that don't actually make the most sense for increasing the flood resiliency of our communities, for addressing the biodiversity crisis. Um, so what, what we need to make sure happens is that we, we rebalance these priorities. We store more carbon in public lands like the Worcester Range than we do in private forests because they haven't been cut as heavily. Um, we could store two to four times more carbon in these forests over the next century to two centuries if we just let them continue to grow old. PCD speaks about the value of these forests from a biodiversity perspective. I'm gonna zoom through these. Today, state lands provide just 2% of the timber supply in Vermont, 2% of the timber supply, that's it. But we consume in Vermont uh, less than we are cutting in Vermont, right? We, we cut 47% more wood every year in this state than we actually use in Vermont. We cut 47% more wood in this state than we use on an annual basis in Vermont. If you remove the 2% that comes from our state lands, it makes a negligible difference to the timber supply in this state, but would have a huge impact on flood resilience, on biodiversity, on all of these other factors that we've been talking about. So to conclude, we've been waiting 40 years for a management plan for the Worcester Range. 40 years is how long it's been since there was last a management planning process for this area. There is no rush to get this done. At the very least, we should be you know, promulgating the rules that were required in 2015, as uh, your legal counsel um, shared with you last week. 
2015 is when the state was asked to do these rules and we still haven't seen a draft yet. Does this management plan really need to come before those rules are promulgated or before the Act 59 process is completed? So these are the questions that I, I hope you'll continue to ask the agency and I hope that you will take action in a small way right now, simply requiring the state to meet its statutory obligations before it moves forward with, with timber sales and with finalizing any additional management plans. Um, and that's the remedy that I've, I've put in front of you with uh, the written testimony here. So happy to take your questions. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. I hope you'll submit the slides. Yes. Do, do members have questions? Representative Smith. Right. Thank you. Uh, a week or so ago, I had suggested that uh, the Worcester Range not be touched at all. And I, I still think more sort of like that, but I also think that a management plan should be in effect of some sort. I've spoken with fish and wildlife officials and unofficials and sports sportsmen's clubs. There's, there should be a happy medium somewhere. Um, I've seen over logging done and it, it does not do any good for a piece of property. Select cut does, it does a good job. And what I'm concerned about is if the state goes in where I'm still standing firm, what I said last week, where the state will go in, if they want to select cut something like that and not have to build pressure treated kiosk and pressure treated steps and everything else so that the rest of the world can go up on that range, I would support a, a small logging operation. But I don't like seeing a beautiful piece of property like that turned into a Palisades Park. Uh, so what do you think about some clear, not clear cutting, some select cutting being done and only that being done? Well, thank you for those comments and, and, and questions. You know, I think what I would say is that the way that this committee can make the biggest impact in the short term is simply to require the rulemaking. It's not to decide what the end result will be for this management plan. But there's a simple fact that the state is not following the law that you have in front of it. So I would love to talk, if we, we should block out another hour to talk about you know, the overall purposes of state land management um, sometime. But really what I think you have the opportunity to do right now is to make sure that we're simply you know, doing our homework when it comes to figuring out what's best for these lands. And the legislature has made it very clear what the state needs to do. And yet what you heard from Commissioner Fisco last week was that their legal counsel tells them they don't need to have rules for state land management. Yet your legal counsel says that they do. And so this needs to be resolved. And the fact that there are so many missing pieces in this plan, from water quality to carbon to, you know, on down the list, uh, we've got to make sure we get these plans right because they have such a major impact on our quality of life, the quality of our environment. So great question. I would love to keep talking to you about it, but I think that really the decision that, that you can make that will make the greatest difference in the short term is let's just get the process right. The process that we've already asked of the agency to follow. Great. Thank, thanks so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Sandy Levine. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm Sandy Levine, and I'm the chair of the Middlesex Planning Commission, so I'm here to give you kind of a hyper-local perspective. Um, Middlesex is a town just north and west of Montpelier. I've lived in Middlesex for over 35 years. I'm an attorney, and I've been the chair of the Planning Commission now for about five years. Previously, I served on the Planning Commission a decade or more ago um, as well. And just by a bit of our planning commission has five volunteers. We have no staff. We are elected officials. I'm here as a local volunteer elected official. During the past five years, our planning commission has updated its town plan. You're actually elected. You run for a place. Yes. Oh. yes. Um, that is an opportunity that the legislature provided some number of years ago. And by petition, we um, 
the, the background, there's a history here. <laughs> history is always a little interesting. Our select board fired our planning commission at one point. They didn't like what we did. Um, <laughs> and uh, there is a provision that we could be elected. And so we sought to be elected and we are now elected. So I answer to the people of Middlesex and I'm actually yeah. on the ballot this year up for election. Um, I just be clear, I was not on the planning commission at the time that they were fired. <laughs> I showed up later. Yeah. Um, so, um, so we've updated our town plan. We um, we've adopted and developed a enhanced energy plan. We obtained village designation for our little downtown. If you've ever been to Red Hen or the filling station or Roots Market, you've been to downtown Middlesex. We updated our zoning regulations and put in place some of the great enhancements that were provided last year of the legislature, but we did that before you did it. Um, completed a study to improve pedestrian and bike safety in our village. We partnered with local business businesses to provide walking paths to and overlooks to the Winooski River right behind Camp Mead in Middlesex. We're participating in the Homes for All project, um, show how those can be, the, as a rural community, to show how um, that can be addressed in a rural community. And we got Citizen Planner of the Year Award one year for all of our work. So you can see we've been busy and we do good work. But I'm not here to talk about all of that. I'm here to talk about um, management plan for state-owned lands in Worcester. Um, but I also want to say that the work that we've done is really thanks in large part to the work that you all do in the legislature and for the tremendous support you've been providing for local planning to enable us, you know, make projects like this really feasible for a small, pretty much all volunteer community to do. So thank you. But in terms of the Worcester management um, management for the state-owned lands in Worcester. As part of our ongoing planning work over the past year, we decided to take a look at and evaluate our town's wildlife, conservation, natural resources, and recreation. And during this effort, it became abundantly clear how valuable the resources are that are literally in our backyard. I know Zach showed you some maps, and um, if you look at a parcel map of Middlesex, Nearly one third of the town across the whole Western portion is either publicly owned land or enrolled in current use. So if you think about a map and Middlesex is sort of like this, six by six square, like six miles by six miles, which most towns in Vermont are, go up the Worcester, the head of the Worcester Range is on this, this edge. That's the, that's the edge of the town of Middlesex is the um, top of the Worcester Range. Go down slope about two miles Nearly all of that land is either publicly owned, we have a town forest as well as the state owned land, or in current use. So when the state planning for the Worcester Range came to our attention, we decided to submit comments. I provided a copy of these comments to you and hope you can take a look at them. And in providing these comments on the plan, we wanted to share the work that we've done and the perspective that we have as a, as a local community. <laughs> for the state planning effort for the Worcester Range so that our planning effort can work in concert with what the state does. And specifically, our recommendation is that the Agency of Natural Resources um, provide for the Middlesex portion of the Worcester Range to be an ecological preserve in accordance with Act 59 and the goals of Vermont conservation design. So both Act 59 and Vermont conservation design have guided our work in Middlesex as a planning commission. I attended uh, you know, leadership training as part of the Agency of Natural Resources, and they really encouraged us, take a look at Vermont conservation design, take a look at these state goals. The work that you do as planners can help advance this, and we've taken that to heart, and we're incorporating that into our, in, into our next um, draft of our town plan. It's unfortunate that the state itself is not actually incorporating those features into its plans. Just to highlight some pieces of our, of our comments and what our re recommendation is based on, it's in part based on survey responses from many Middlesex residents that show overwhelming support for protecting natural areas along the Worcester Range. 80% of the respondents 
agreed that all undeveloped larger forested areas in Middlesex are significant and should be protected. And 90% of the respondents agreed that undeveloped forested areas should connect to larger forested areas and are significant, that are significant and should be protected. And the Worcester Range came up as the most repeated identified area across the whole section of the survey. Our town plan, the current town plan, states as an objective to maintain the quality and use of existing conserved lands. And as a strategy, we are to coordinate with natural resource agencies, organizations, and outdoor recreation planners to manage conservation plans for publicly owned lands in Middlesex. Our comments also address the context of state lands in Middlesex. If you drive any of the rural back roads, avoid the mud when you can. Um, the Worcester Range is always right there. If you have any activity at Rumney School, you look out the window, Worcester Range is right there. You go to any concerts at our bandstand, the Worcester Range is right there. And whether you're fishing, hunting, or just appreciating the wildlife that's there, Worcesters provide that for us. Our updating mapping has also taken into account the resilience that is needed in the face of the effects of climate change which has hit Middlesex incredibly hard. This last flood, our roads, many of our roads were completely impassable and we're still suffering from that. So being able to use the, the ecological resources of the Worcester Range to help for flood mitigation would be terrific. And our, the mapping that we did showed that the state's biofinder resource, priority conservation areas in the Worcester Range are identified to better support habitat, clean water, and climate resilience. And finally, and I, Zach mentioned some of this as well, the location, the scale, the topography, and just the abundance of the resources that are needed for an ecological rain preserved are all present in the lands of the Worcester Range. There's lots and lots of incredibly valuable information and mapping that's included in the draft state management plan for the Worcester Range. And based on that, as well as our town planning efforts, we look forward to the Agency of Natural Resources incorporating our comments and recommendations into its final plan. The goals of Act 59 are clear, and the state lands in the Worcester Range, including the lands in Middlesex, have a very valuable role to play in helping the state meet these goals. We look forward to these goals being specifically incorporated into the management of the state lands for the Worcester Range, and hope that that happens. So I uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to, prevent, to present our local perspective and share our comments with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for your testimony um, and your work as a volunteer planning commission member. Do members have questions? Representative Pat. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for you and also uh, the folks from Worcester coming up might, might uh, have something to say as well. Uh, our committee members received a fairly lengthy email yesterday from Commissioner Fitzko uh, talking a lot about the process that led up to where, where they are now. And that includes uh, saying that they had started with uh, surveying people in 2020 um, uh, uh, about this and, and, and links to the press announcements about that. When I looked at those, uh, I realize maybe a handful of people in Middlesex and Worcester might have seen those press announcements. I'm wondering whether you recollect, uh, as the, from the Planning Commission perspective, having been approached about this uh, back in 2020 or so. I don't personally recollect that, and we did not provide input at that time. Okay. It was when we, we saw that there was a notice of the draft plan and because we were happy to be working on this very same issue just at the local level, we thought it was a good opportunity to try and coordinate with them. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So we are going to hear from Johnny Waterhouse from Worcester, <clears throat> joining us by Zoom, excuse me. <clears throat> Welcome. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my name is Chani Waterhouse, as you said, and I'm the chair of the Worcester Planning Commission. It's nice to be here with Sandy and hear her comments as well. Um, 
I'm going to be looking over here at my other screen. So that's why I'm not looking at you. So our planning commission submitted comments regarding the management plan for the Worcester Range Management Unit to the Agency of Natural Resources Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And you should have those comments available electronically. Um, I personally have been on the planning commission for just two years. Um, in Worcester, our commission is appointed by the select board. Currently, we're comprised of four citizen volunteers. Um, our commission has primarily been working on our town plan. Our new town plan was approved just about a year ago. And since then we were able to obtain village center designation and we're working on an energy plan. So a little bit about us. Um, because we were working on a town plan, we did a constituent survey in 2019. And through that, survey, we heard from folks in Worcester that they care deeply about the future of the Worcester range. And that's reflected in our town plan. It was a variety of different things that folks said they valued the most um, were related to um, uh, wildlands, forest, um, wildlife. And goal six of our plan is to conserve and protect the town's important natural resources of water, mountains, and their ridgelines space, air, soil, wildlife habitat, as well as historic structures and viewscapes. With, that's a quote, and with particular attention to natural and fragile areas. Our plan directs us in the selector to, quote, investigate regulatory and non-regulatory methods for preserving important farm and forest lands. So during the, for the past few months, as the NRs Plan has gotten a lot of attention. We received very thoughtful and extensive written input from five residents in Worcester. And four of those folks expressed significant concerns or opposition to elements of the plan. We also observed a very, very active conversation among our neighbors on Front Porch Forum pretty much every day for weeks. And I don't know how many of those folks submitted formal comments to the ANR. My personal takeaway was about just how important and beloved these mountains and forests are to the people who live alongside them. That's definitely true for me as well. I um, have lived in Worcester since I was a child and many folks have like multi-generational families who have lived in, um, alongside these forests. So for our town, there really are no more important forest lands than those of the Worcester range. And if you've been to Worcester, you know that these mountains rise across the town's western border. They're prominently visible from many points around town and the sun sets right over those mountains every night. It's very beautiful. And the Worcester Range, I learned through this process that the Worcester Range is the largest mountain range in Vermont without resort development and bisecting roads, which is pretty amazing. And this um, state-owned land is the largest functional contiguous wildland in Northern Vermont. It really is a special place. And Long range management plan highlights many aspects of this. Um, exceptional ecological importance at local, statewide, and regional scales, trees up to 120 years old, middle habitat to a range of wildlife species, including endangered species and species that depend on interior forest habitat that's rare in Vermont, um, wildlife connectivity that has a significant at a regional scale. I know you've been hearing about this probably from other folks as well. Um, our planning commission, as you've heard from others, is very aware of the um, Act 59, Vermont Community Resilience and Biodiversity Protection Act, and the targets to conserve 30% of the land by 2030 and 50% by 2050, um, and the importance of um, incorporating the Vermont Conservation Design Framework, and the direction from the legislature the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board to inventory conserve land by July 1st of this year. And the really um, robust input process that the VHCB is currently engaging in that's um, allowing for extensive input from the public as well as experts and professionals in the field. And the directive to develop a statewide conservation plan by the end of uh, 2025, which will lay out you know, strategies for managing land and uh, achieving the Act's very important conservation goals at a state level. One key question that we looked at is the um, inventory process is going to explore what counts as conserved land, and the VHCB is directed to define more fully three types of conserved lands, ecological reserve areas, 
biodiversity cons conservation areas and natural resource management areas, which seems really valuable based on, I've been learning a lot, this is not my area of expertise at all, but seems like the refining or clarifying these definitions will be really an important part of a statewide, really coordinated effort to make sure that we achieve the goals of Act 59. So based on all of this, our recommendation to the agency was to delay adoption of a management plan until after the VHCB has presented a comprehensive conservation plan to the legislature in 2025. It seems to us that planning, when, when there's a really well-coordinated planning uh, process underway, we should participate in that um, as fully and robustly as possible. We just see a lot of value in that. Um, we uh, also feel like people of our town, our region and our state have a right to as much current information as possible to inform our own input, something as significant as the first management plan in a very long time for our beloved Worcester Range. Um, there is so much to learn and it seems like the science of practice forestry perhaps is evolving in this time of so much rapid change in our world. And we all need to be learning from the experts who are at the leading edge of understanding that science. Thank you so much for hearing my input and for your deliberations. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and your time as a volunteer planning commission member. <clears throat> Go ahead. Can I, can I say one thing I forgot to mention uh, to Avram's question? Uh, we also were very curious about the um, department's assertion that local planning commissions had been um, reached out to that there had been an opportunity for a lot of community input in 2020. Our, I wasn't on the planning commission in 2020, but folks who were not have any recollection of being aware this process was happening at all or have received any outreach from the department. Okay. All right, do members have questions? Thanks again for your testimony. Next, we will invite Odo Carey. Uh, printed some slides because I didn't want to be the person with the technology that didn't work. And I, I don't mean for them to distract from what I'm going to say to you, but there, there are some things that will help explain what I'm going to say. Good morning. I'm Voto Carey, and I'm grateful to speak with you about the Agency of Natural Resources Worcester Range Management Unit Plan. I also respect the time and energy required of you to make to, and take on and understand the many complex issues that come before you. I'm a 40-year-old, 40, no, not a 40-year-old. I'm a 40-year resident of Worcester, Vermont and live in the shadow of the Worcester Range and Putnam State Forest. I taught middle school science at U32 for 27 years, including an annual elevation study on Hunger Mountain. I spent many hours, though recently not as many as when I was in my 30s, on the eastern side of the Worcester Range, experiencing its wildness, remoteness, wildlife, and changes resulting from various logging operations since the mid-1980s. I respect the many staff of the Agency of Natural Resources and their dedicated work. Their ecologists, biologists, foresters, and others have collected and assembled vast amounts of data on the area. However, I see the long range plan for the Worcester Range as incomplete and not addressing issues currently required to meet the future. I will discuss process, look at data presented by the a &R at last week's testimony through a different lens and offer suggestions for the future. While well intended, the rollout of the plan was and is completely lacking in public transparency. I participated in the public scoping process of 2020 and can only believe I found out about it from my neighbor who was working with the Trust for Public Land the public meetings in Worcester and Stowe did not allow any public comment or questions about the management plan from the floor. 
Two requests were made by the Worcester Select Board for Forest Parks and Recreation to come to an open question and answer select board meeting. Forest Parks and Recreation denied the invitations to attend. This request came from the town of Worcester, which contains almost 50% of the unit's land, 9,000 plus acres, and many interested and concerned citizens. Both of the aforementioned situations don't exactly inspire confidence and promote the department's credibility, nor seem accountable, accessible, and helpful to the public. It was also disheartening to hear the differing opinions between the A&R and Legislative Council's views concerning the use of rules when developing long-range plans. A situation similar to the new hunting and trapping regulations that do not conform with Vermont state law and are now in litigation. As defined in the plan, most of the newly designated highly sensitive management areas on the second slide, they're in light blue, the dark blue is the existing natural area, has very steep slopes, thin soils, and are easily damaged if not protected. The Moss Glen Falls natural area is also included. On the third side, you can see the categories 1.11 A, B, and C. 111D, which is Moss Glen, are the newly designated areas. 1.8A is the existing Worcester Range natural area. And 3.0 is the general management area where vegetation management occurs. The 9,651 highly sensitive management acres are largely protected by default with their steep slopes, wet soils, ridge lines, and high elevations. It would be expected that these areas would be off limits to vegetation management. And I have trouble accepting and take issue with such acreage being used to satisfy Vermont Conservation Design's old forest targets for the Northern Green Mountain biophysical region with no effort toward meeting those targets with natural community protections in the lower elevation. The Worcester Range Management Union, Unit has a 10% target for forest management and resource extraction, of which 71% occurs on the lower elevations of the wild, undeveloped eastern side of the range. The majority of the timber harvest will take place in the Middlesex Worcester 3,431 acre contiguous forest block. This makes up 40% of this block's area. This includes the newly acquired Patterson Brook Track and its logging road infrastructure, which offers the state new access to mature forests and other timber stands. Eight timber stands to be managed in this block are forest types of primarily beech, sugar maple, and yellow birch, components of the northern hardwood forest. This harvest plan seems contradictory and at odds with the following statements from the plan. I quote, northern hardwood forest forms the matrix into which all other communities in the plan fit. This forest type is also the most common type in Vermont. Over 6,000 acres of northern hardwood forests were mapped within the unit, all part of a single occurrence of very high ecological quality, A-ranked. This example is of statewide significance. It is recommended that state significant natural communities be afforded a higher level of protection than other areas of the management unit, end quote. The A&R and the forest product industry lobby continue to stress the importance of timber harvests on state lands to provide important forest products to Vermonters. A 2022 USDA Forest Service inventory of saw log volume harvests in Vermont shows only 2% coming off Vermont state lands. By forest park Recreation's estimate only 1% to 3% of timber sold in Vermont comes from state land. Thus, the volume of coming off of the Worcester Range would be a very small fraction of this 2% and would not negatively impact the forest product industry or jobs in this sector. Last week, you heard 
that the Worcester Management Unit plans is consistent with Vermont conservation design and that the new 5,500 highly sensitive management acreage adds significant amounts towards meeting old forest targets for this region. I have to believe the intent of the Vermont conservation design for promoting old forest structure would include more than forest types found in areas defined by steep slopes, wet and thin fragile soils, bedrock and ridge lines. While satisfying acreage targets, those areas of forest don't meet the challenge of developing old forests in the matrix community in the lower elevations. If this is the case, I have little hope for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board's land inventory prioritizing ecological reserve areas in such areas as the 3,431 acre contiguous forest block in Middlesex and Worcester. Much of the high elevation, highly sensitive management acreage, which includes the subalpine zone and Krumholtz or short twisted wood, simply cannot develop old forest characteristics with large trees, abundant dead and down wood, and natural canopy gaps. Vermont certainly needs both wildlands and working forests. The Worcester Range offers the state and the people of Vermont a rare opportunity to practice new conservation strategies with passive management in the lower elevations. For perspective, the state of New York has constitutionally protected two and a half million acres as wild forest lands since 1894. Having the Worcester Range designated as an ecological reserve seems a small ask. Left alone and allowed to follow natural rewilding processes, the Worcester Range will develop into a rare area in the modern world where generations of Vermonters can experience an unspoiled area and its ecological values. A management plan covering a span of 20 years should be up to date with its categories and terminology and align with current legislation from its inception. The Worcester Range Management Unit offers the opportunity to guarantee old forests and promote ecological functioning landscapes at all ele elevations in perpetuity. Forest parks and recreation should consider a protected Worcester Range Management Unit as a control or outlier, where in 100 years, nature's resiliency can be measured against the outcomes of human intervention. As my daughter expressed, quote, it's an interesting and egotistical argument that forest and wild areas need human management in order to th thrive. I'm not convinced. We are not in a climate crisis due to a lack of human intervention, end quote. Thank you for your time, and I will be glad to answer any questions or clarify anything I said. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. We have it in writing. Um, we don't. I don't know. If, did you submit your? <clears throat> did you submit your slides to vote as well? Uh, I have not. I can submit my slides, and I think I also will. I know I sent my original letter uh, comment to several of you, but not to the whole committee. And I will bombard your email with another letter. All right, or send it to Will, and he can post it under your name. And get in okay. Forward. Find it there. Okay. Members have is it, is it members have questions. Thanks again for your testimony. All right, members, that takes us up to the noon hour. We will come back at one o'clock today to hear oh some follow up from yesterday from the Natural Resources Board. It's 687, so we are adjourned.